I have been living with a minister for the last 55 years. That's a long time. I'm going to put you here. And I can do that or I can say that because I'm a PK. And I grew up in a home where my precious mom had no idea what she was getting into when she became a pastor's wife. So she wasn't nearly as excited about being a pastor's wife as I was about being the daughter of someone who was passionate about ministry. So it is a joy for me to be here this morning sharing. My husband and I are marriage and family therapists, and we studied that whole area, not so that we could become marriage and family therapists, but because we knew that there was a place to of better understanding, to be able to better minister to our children, to our parents, families, and congregations by having this kind of training. So we have thoroughly enjoyed the integration of all of theology and psychology when it's supported by biblical principles. So this morning, I'd like to invite you to read along with me. Who's controlling my thing? Is it you, my friend? Awesome. Thank you for being my, my helper. I'd like for you to join me in reading out loud the condition of ministering to end time children. Here we go. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Join me in bowing our heads and inviting the Spirit, Holy Spirit, please rain down on this incredibly special and anointed group of men and women. These are perilous times, Father, and you have called each one of them specifically to this critical ministry in this time in history. We ask for the anointing of your spirit and give him permission to whisper in our ears things that may not be said today. But do not let us leave this retreat without having heard your directives for our lives and our ministries. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Woo, no wonder. So it's not easy ministering to kids based on what we just read. Ministering to end time kids is not for cowards. How many of you have had difficulties finding volunteers? <laughs> Why do you think people don't want to volunteer? Give, just throw out some answers. What, what, what's, what's holding people back from saying, yes, I'll help you? Tired. They want a day off from their own kids. Too many other commitments. Fear of the kids. Kids are getting rougher and rougher. The crowd is getting rough, if you haven't noticed lately. So I'm going to paint you a scenario of what is making it so challenging to minister to kids today. Just one of so many facts about low-income children. This particular statistics are for kids age 6 to 11. 45% of kids age 6 to 11 in America live in low-income families. 22% live in poor families. There's a difference between the two. Then these kids are more than twice as likely as adults 65 years and older to live in poor families. And you know that our senior citizens are living in kind of poor level living as it is. It's just so that you have an idea what the difference between, um, oh, I guess I didn't put it here. Oh, yes, I did. So the threshold for poverty is $23,000 for a family of four with two children. 
$18,000 for a family of three that have one child. This is what people are making a year, and you wonder why there's financial stress at home, and we'll talk about that as we proceed today. $16,000 is what a family of two with one child makes, and that would be the threshold for, uh, the, for family poverty. And at the very bottom, you'll see the breakdown of statistics. Of course, um, some of it is predictable due to single parenting mostly. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so all of this will translates into stress. We're going to be talking about stress and how that impacts our ministry and our effectiveness with the children that we are, children, youth, and teens that we're ministering to. So the number of single-parent homes have doubled in the 50 years. What does that have to do with anything? Well, you'll also notice some of the statistics regarding ethnicity. The highest level of single-parent homes is with our African-American families. Second in line are the Hispanic families. And then all the rest of the conglomeration of people that don't specify black or white. Um, and then the white. So kids living in single-parent homes without fathers specifically, fatherless children. As you know, if you haven't read the statistics, I invite you to go home and dig even deeper because it'll only fill you with more compassion and more enthusiasm about understanding your population so that you can minister and serve and be more effective with them. A lot of this is very well known. Higher juvenile delinquency, more behavior problems, poor educational performance. Kids that live with a single uh, parent are most likely to grow up in poverty. Higher rates of mental illness. There was a study done in New Orleans that showed that 80% of preschoolers that were admitted to psychiatric units came from fatherless homes. Did you see? Did you even know that preschoolers can be admitted into a psychiatric facility? Isn't that sad? No surprise, my friends. We have an enemy that has been planning and plotting the, the extinction of fathers in families because he knows the effects that it wreaks on not just that generation but on the four generations following the father who leaves his home. Higher rates of suicide for single-parent homes, earlier sexual activity for reasons that we probably don't have time to get into. Um, uh, there's so much to say in so little time, so we'll keep clipping through. Higher rates of teenage pregnancy, higher rates of criminality, higher probability of being sexually abused. Hello, when your mom has the boyfriends and the boyfriends live in and the, all these things can happen, although it doesn't have to be the boyfriend as we all know. Higher rates of child abuse, of course. And a Michigan study showed that 49%, almost half of all cases of child abuse reported in Michigan were committed by stressed out, probably well-intentioned, but stressed out single moms. Percentage of children in single family uh, homes. You'll notice that guess who wins, wins the, the blue ribbon? Woohoo! Where you serve. Well, most of you serve. I know there's people from other places um, in North America. Um, so United States wins. And who's, who's the, what's the country with the lowest percentage of children living in single level, um, single parent homes? So I did a quick, um, a really quick Google search and discovered that it's interesting because of the correlation. We've already said that when a father isn't at home, you have a, a, a dictionary full of side effects, if you will. So I compared Italy with United States really quickly and discovered that rape per million in Italy is 76.57 76.57 people are raped in Italy per million. In the United States, 274 per million. Total crimes in Italy, 2.23 million. US, good old US of A, 11.88. Gun crimes, Italy, 11.9. Good old US of A, 88.8. .8, and we won't even get into that discussion today. We'd be here another week, wouldn't we? All right. Murder rate, Italy, 
529, Italy ranked the 77th state, way at the bottom of the list. Good old US of A, 12,996, we ranked number nine in the world for murder rate. So I just, did that, I, out of curiosity, I thought, okay, if Italy has the lowest rate of single parent homes, I wonder what, what's happening in the crime area. Well, this is the result. Parents are pressuring their kids out of childhood sooner than ever before. Remember that I'm painting a landscape. I'm painting you the culture. I'm painting you the life of the kids that we're serving. Increasing numbers of parents are pushing their kids to read books aimed at a higher wage to fast track their kids so that they can be sure their kids are going to go to college and get a master's and get a PhD and be successful. More than 60% of parents try to get their children to read literature above their reading levels. Adolescence is also being stretched at both ends with kids becoming teenagers earlier and becoming adults way later. We still have our 35-year-old adolescents that move back in after college and all that good stuff. Institute for Public Policy Research supported the notion that pushing children too hard at a young age can. Oh, what a surprise. Because you and I know a precious little lady who wrote hundreds, hundred and plus years ago that later was better than earlier. So it's so amazing. I get so excited when research proves what we have known in our red books for all of these years. It's pretty exciting. So, uh, and of course, we know that academic results themselves do not ensure a higher income. Uh, and too much focus on them actually can inhibit social development of the children who are pushed early into academic success and as well as wreaks havoc on their confidence. Overscheduled kids have the same stress-related health and psychological problems that overscheduled adults have. How many of you know one overscheduled child? You don't have to confess if it's your own. <coughs> So, 10 signs that, you're, that kids that you're serving are overscheduled. One, the child has no downtime to do nothing. Two, the child has irritability and grumpiness of an old man with low testosterone levels. <laughs> We're talking about a kid who's hurt, it's, has a headache, has a stomach ache, doesn't want to go, doesn't want to come, doesn't want to sit. It's interesting. I think that it's very important that we begin to reframe the way our kids are communicating to us as parents and teachers. They're not just bad kids. They're communicating. And oftentimes they're communicating that they are exhausted, burnt out, and overscheduled. Number three, child ceases to enjoy favorite activities. So your child or your student used to love to play the guitar for the fun of it, and all of a sudden they stop doing what they have loved doing all along. And you're wondering like, well, why don't you play the guitar anymore? Well, it's not just that your child is becoming lazy and unmotivated, although sometimes there's a little bit of splash of that, but it could very well mean, it could very well be one sign of an overscheduled child. Number four, the child begins to feel that he or she can't keep up, so they start going to bed later they start getting up earlier in the morning, and their grades are still dropping. Because guess what happens when your child gets eight to 10 hours of sleep? Does that even happen anymore? <laughs> with electronics that kids stay up playing with after you're asleep and you assume they're asleep? So what happens is growth hormone, and we are, the whole body is regenerated, neurons, all this is happening during sleep. Number five, your car becomes your house. You are spending more money on gas, and you are live, spending more hours in your car than you are at home. Number six, you notice that your child is becoming anxious and or depressed, and oftentimes these kind of work together. A lot of times depression causes anxiety, uh, and so they, they tend to kind of be kissing cousins. Number seven, you notice that your child no longer is connecting with his or her best friends. There's no time for friends anymore. Number eight, 
no time for family meals. Of course not. You're eating most of them driving through in the car, right? Number nine, a child that was otherwise growing up appearing to be quite secure becomes suddenly very emotionally needy. And typically the way parents respond to emotionally needy children as well as teachers is it's quite annoying to have, to be so rushed with your own life that suddenly you have a child who begins to cling to mommy and doesn't let you do what you need to do and doesn't want to go where you want her to go. So then instead of affirming and, and identifying what that child is actually communicating, parents and teachers tend to punish or give consequences to kids who become clingy and annoying. Number 10, the parent is as exhausted and burnt out as their child. 10 signs that your child or the children that you're working with are overscheduled. So let's talk a little bit about domestic abuse. And before we do so, I want to define really quickly that Domestic violence includes physical abuse, verbal, sexual, financial, religious. But most importantly, I want to focus on the reality that domestic violence is also emotional and psychological abuse. Recent studies are showing that physical beatings and even, which this one startled me, even sexual abuse can sometimes not have as noxious an effect on the development and emotional stability of a child than psychological and emotional abuse. No bruises, no signs, no CPS calls, no way of knowing, except we will talk about some of the behaviors of kids who are suffering this type of insidious, invisible, if you will, domestic violence. Children who have been psychologically abused suffered from anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, symptoms of PTSD, social anxiety disorder, attachment problems, and suicidality at the same rate, and in some cases at a greater rate than children who were physically or sexually abused. Five million kids witness one of those forms of domestic violence yearly in the United States. 40 million adults grew up living with domestic violence of the five sorts I just described. Some of us are in this room right now. Third, kids are much more likely to experience significant short-term and long-term psychological problems. Children often meet the criteria, the clinical criteria in the DSM-4R for, for post-traumatic stress disorder. Effects on their brains when they do the CT scans are similar to combat veterans. You think the enemy doesn't know what he's doing when he grabs someone way back 10 generations and the domestic violence cycle is passed forward, he knows exactly the havoc that it is wreaking on our culture and end time children and families. Five learning difficulties. These kids have learning difficulties, lower IQs, deficiencies in visual motor skills and problems with attention and memory. All of these are directly correlated to kids who are living in a toxic environment. They come to Sabbath school, don't they? And they're the child who just, no matter how much you're jumping around and excited and trying to keep their attention, they just seem to be off somewhere far, far away. And we, humanly speaking, say like, well, what's wrong with that child? This, how disrespectful, he's not paying attention, he's not, I'm, I'm, I'm all animated, what's going on? And I repeat, all communication, no, all behavior, all behavior communicates. So if you forget everything that's said, please don't forget, all behavior communicates. Six, kids in domestic violence homes are 
more likely to be physically abused themselves and or be seriously neglected. Seven, kids living with domestic violence of all the kinds that we just discussed are 50 times more likely to commit suicide, 50 times more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. And it's important that we say this morning or clarify. If you have kids and they're getting younger and younger, kids who are into drugs and and or alcohol. Precious kids. You see, alcohol and drugs are essentially a a form of self-medication. Self-medication. I am so stressed out living where I live, and we'll talk about the effects on the brain when you live in this kind of an environment. These kids have no coping skills because obviously they didn't learn any at home. All that they learned is that you cope with stress by smacking or verbally smacking someone. So they have no skills and are, and, and are the enemy's prey as he offers them alternatives for finding comfort and rest and a break from the insanity of the anxiety and the cortisol levels that they are carrying around in their system. Number eight, children of domestic violence are three times more likely to repeat the cycle in adulthood, so they will either either become a perpetrator or they will marry a perpetrator. Isn't it amazing that these girls will sometimes say, I will, I, whatever I'll do, I will not marry my father. They saw dad beat up on mom and they determined I will not repeat that. I'm not, I'm not stupid, am I? I'm not gonna marry dad. And lo and behold, Mr. Charming, the perfect guy, turns out to be dad in disguise. That's right. Number nine, living with domestic violence significantly alters a child's DNA and it ages them prematurely seven to ten years. My dear colleagues, stress, emotional stress, kills. And 10, kids living with domestic violence are 74 times more likely to commit a violent crime against someone else. UNICEF is calling domestic violence one of the most damaging, unaddressed human rights violations in the world today. So, Just for my, the sake of my benefit and so that I can maybe address this particular distinguished group a little bit more specifically, how many of you work with uh, children between the age of zero and three? Well, most of you are directors, I'm imagining, right? So you actually have the whole gamut. So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll stop those, the questioning that just occurred to me. Next. So we ask ourselves, why, are, what, why is stress so important? And we're going to discover today that stress, which gets going the whole fight-flight system, your adrenals produce a hormone called cortisol, well-known today, not so well-known, maybe 50 years ago. But we will see that when a newborn is, uh, when a newborn's brain weighs approximately 333 grams, give or take. By the time that baby turns two, his brain has grown how many times over? Three times over. Everything that happens between age zero and two is so important. And again, our little red books told us, right, so many years ago, that the most important and formative years of a human's life was between the ages of one and? She said one to five and somewhere, and then one to seven somewhere else. So the first five to seven years are pivotal, pivotal. Brain is literally forming circuits and is growing in size. So brain development there are effects, the stress on a brain, and and this is just a quick picture of showing you the frontal lobe. We're gonna talk about the whole, the amygdala section. 
uh, continue really quick. I'm going to try to breeze through. This is really um, interesting here. This brain, and just so that you know, the, the, the healthiest circulation is are the red areas. The second healthiest are the yellow. The black sections are really bad. This is like no, um, no, no activity, no brain activity, almost like brain death, if you will. So the healthy brain is the one on your left. You're going to notice a lot of red, a lot of, you know, a relatively good amount of red and yellow and green, and not so much black, those, those black holes, if you will, in the brain. Well, the brain on the right, uh, the CT scan, was taken of, uh, of an orphan in an orf a baby or in, a, in an orphanage in Europe. This was a baby that was abused through neglect. No stimulation, no huggy, huggy wuggy, kissy wissies, you're wonderful, I love you, singing to you, rubbing your belly, giving you a bath, all of that stuff. So was incredibly abused through neglect. And you'll notice the effect that it has on the brain. You can continue. No, you're good. All right, so we were talking really quickly about why and why I'm, I'm, I'm getting here for going this direction for an important purpose. So what happens when you have the surge, your adrenals surge out the, the, the um, cortisol, the stress hormone, what it does is it, it, it hyper alerts our limbic system, give or take, uh, in that section of the brain. And then what happens is that the whole frontal lobe, which is the part of our brain where we make choices, where we make decisions, our personality, it's a very important part of our brain, the frontal lobe. That part of the, the brain is sort of like over, overridden by the more impulsive, emotional, uh, the part of the brain that makes us feel sometimes under stress like we're drowning. We flood emotionally. Have any of you ever been so stressed out that you really can't remember almost your husband's name? You know you can kill him, but you don't remember his name. <laughs> that ever happened to you? I mean, you don't have to confess to the killing part, but you've, you know, where you see someone and you're stressed and you don't remember their name and they're like your good friend, but you're just so stressed you don't remember their name. Thank you. So here's another CT. This one is the brains of two three-year-old children. The image on the left is healthy brain, and, and I'm sorry, the other brain um, I said was of the, Roman, the orphan, but the other one was severe abuse. This is the orphan one. The Ro a Romanian orphan who suffered sensory deprivation, the right brain is not just the, the two uh, ventricles, the black holes, if you will, are larger, but you notice the difference in the size of the brains? Do you know that when a child lives with anxiety and stress at home, and typically he or she carries the stress to school, and the stress that they carry to school from home is what generates misbehavior. So guess what? They're the ones who are always in trouble at School, too. So stress doesn't just stay at home locked up under that pretty roof and pretty door. It follows them to school. They have additional stress at school. And then this is my greatest concern, my friends and colleagues. Then Sabbath rolls around. And they're rushed. Another That must be the most stressful time for Adventist families in the whole week. Between 6 and 8.30 in the morning on Sabbath mornings. So never mind the stress they just survived just to get up and have breakfast and get dressed and brush their teeth and comb their hair in time for Sabbath school. And sometimes that's even wishful thinking anymore. But my, my hope and my dream is that our Sabbath school departments would become the one place on earth that's safe. That one moment in the week that they know they were gonna, they're going to enter a safe zone where they are going to be loved on, they're going to be accepted, and I don't have time to get into the study, but if they misbehave, you may even have to bring a little bag of tricks like Felix the cat, and you reward them when they do something naughty. Doesn't that sound counterintuitive? to reward a child when he's done something naughty. 
there was a edu an educator psychologist that determined that he was going to try something. So he had this particular child in his classroom that was a thief. <gasps> oh, he was a thief. And so the teacher decided, I am at my wit's end. No matter what I do, the consequences, he continues stealing things from his you know, classmates. And so he decided, I'm going to begin to reward this little guy. So every time that he stole something, he would give him candy, his favorite, chocolate-covered something, my kind of guy. And so it was interesting because the teacher was asking him to self-report. So he said, every time you steal, I want you to come tell me, because he wouldn't always necessarily get caught right away. So the child started saying, you know, the day after, you know, I, did, I took Joe's baseball. And so he'd sit him down and say, well, you know that's wrong. Yeah, I know it's wrong. Okay, here's your chocolate. I said I was going to give you chocolates every time that you stole something. Now, for those of you that are anal retentive punishers, I'm sure your blood pressure's gone up. <laughs> I'm sure if you had BB guns, you'd be shooting them at me. You'd be, and if none of the above is correct, you think I'm crazy or he was crazy. But what was he doing for some of you more relaxed? Reverse psychology, yes. And what would it be called theologically? Grace. He was being graced. So he was attacked with grace, and this little thief became obedient, stopped stealing, felt loved, became a man of good. Grace changes people. Uh, no time for that. We'll continue. Uh, no time for that. Oh, yeah, let's just stop for just a second. Really quick. So parental stress. So they have learned that the studies are showing that kids that grow up in homes where there's just not necessarily fist fighting. Remember that abuse is a very wide uh, range, if you will, but where mom and dad are, you know, kind of always at each other, and then, you know, you know when parents come to the point where they say, you know what, I'm going to stop talking to him, because if I ignore him, my kids won't hear us fighting anymore. You know anyone who's thought of that plan? Yep, I tried that one time. So I stopped talking to my husband for a week. I was just tired of the fighting. Our Zachary must have been two. He's 21 now. And the second week went by, and we just weren't talking. I figured he, when he was ready to come apologize, <laughs> I would forgive him. Unfortunately, he had the same game plan. The third week went by, the fourth week went by, the second month went by, the third month went by, I kid you not, time is going fast, so I'm going to go really, really fast. Jump, fast forward. Eight months went by. I'm embarrassed to say that. Pride. It's pretty intensive. Obviously, we didn't know these studies. But see, this, the studies are showing that parents that disconnect emotionally but continue to live under the same roof can cause more damage than even parents who are just on each other all the time verbally. Our kids are sponges. They can feel everything. You know, there was a study done where a psychologist, of course, got permission from the parents to ask the children this particular very personal question question. And the question was, kids, how often do mommy and daddy do hanky-panky? They got, you know, parents got permission, the, the, the researchers got permission, and, and, and the kids, you know, Lisa said, oh, you know, whatever her answer was, and Tommy answered, and Jimmy answered, and Melissa answered. And when they went back and asked the parents, you know, now we want to know what the reality is. What, how often does this happen? Do you know what? Oh, did I, I forgot to say, the kids are aged from seven, six to nine. Six to nine. Do you know what? They were right on target. So what happens behind closed doors does not stay behind closed doors. 
kids know everything. We cannot fool our kids, which is what makes ministering to kids so vital and important that we understand the reality of what it is to be a child in this stressed and stressed out culture. So everyone's heard about IQ. So as teachers, we, go, we send our kids to school to raise their IQs. And then we also have heard recently the, the, big, the big thing is EQ, right? Because as all of you know, you can have all the smarts in all the world, but if you can't manage your emotions, when I worked uh, as a nurse, it's been a while now, in uh, critical care thoracic uh, surgery ICU, there was a particular incredibly intelligent cardiothoracic surgeon, big tall guy, and he was fantastic. He was brilliant, actually, intellectually. I'm sure his IQ was off the charts. But every time that he'd come back with send one of his patients from the OR to our unit, he would find something that the nurse had done wrong to begin to have a meltdown and he'd become a two-year-old in front of the patient. Well, he was off in La La Land and under anesthesia, but he would do it in front of the, the family. He didn't, care, he didn't care who was around. He would meltdown and turn into a two-year-old and go into a tirade of, of abusing, verbally abusing the nurse that hadn't done exactly what he had specified in his orders. We all know people like that, that are smart but emotionally incapacitated or disabled, if you will. So, and of course, uh, Daniel Goleman's book was one of the four, four, four front, front, and there's lots of books after him that have come out. But it's really, in, in, and then of course, in EQ, what we're trying, what we've developed, or the, the whole theory is developing that kids and adults, especially adults, they, I think they divide, devised it to have higher, uh, Control, uh, not higher control, but just more workplace effectiveness training. So it's helping people have self-awareness, knowing what's all the feelings and emotions that are going on with me, being able to read what's going on with you out there, being able to manage myself, and then also being able to manage my relationships with others. That's the four, the four constructs of emotional uh, EQ, emotional quotient. So, continue, so there was a little bit of like, what's more important? Is it IQ? Is it EQ? Well, we're learning that they're actually both very important. But if you have to choose between the two, which one would you imagine is more vital for surviving on planet Earth? That's right. And so uh, this is the whole new thing is now IQ plus EQ equals success. success. Simple dimple, go ahead. Well, in 1977, Dana Zohar coined the term spiritual intelligence. So you have IQ, EQ, and now SQ. And he's kind of, you know, guru, new agey, la la land kind of a person, but continue. And of course, there's now books that are trying to, you know, bring it into the more biblical spiritual realm that we don't have time to get into. So now we're realizing what, of course, the little red books. I've been saying all along that man is triphasic, mind, spirit, and body. So the world is kind of, science is catching up. Woohoo! Science is catching up. All right. So this is one of, the one of the many definitions. So spiritual intelligence calls for multiple ways of knowing and for the integration of the inner life of the mind and the spirit with the outer life of the work in the world. It can be cultivated through questioning, inquiry, and practice. Spiritual evidence experiences may also contribute to the development depending on the context and means of integration. Spiritual maturity is and expressed through wisdom and compassion action in the world. Spiritual intelligence is necessary for the discernment in making spiritual choices that contribute to psychological well-being and overall healthy spiritual development, blah, 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 blah. You notice a very key missing factor? Spiritual intelligence what factors would have to be necessary? Shoot, really quickly. Compassion. Grace, Grace God. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. <coughs> Humility. Love. Relationships. Love. Love. Service. Service. Happiness. Happiness. Joy. Woohoo! <laughs> Praise, community. Praise, community. Thank you. All of those sound wonderful.
Hebrews 4.12 says, read along with me really quickly, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Friends, I don't have to preach to the choir. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The statistics that I shared with you earlier on are proof that the enemy's plan is alive and well and functioning, functioning to a T. The question is, where does the Adventist Church and Children's Ministry come in to intercept the reality of what the enemy's plan has wreaked and continues to wreak on culture and society? 1 John 3, it reminds us, read out loud with me, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, God was manifested that he might what? That he might what? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Friends, I think that a definition, and I apologize for the theologically incorrect portrayal of the enemy. He doesn't have horns, and we know that. And he probably doesn't have exposed flesh, but it's the best one I could find. Let us not kid ourselves this morning, precious kindred spirits in, min in children's ministries. We are in the middle of a war. It's a real war. There is a war raging in me 24-7. And so I would like to propose that a end-time Seventh-day Adventist definition of spiritual intelligence must include knowledge and practical skills on how we might fight and be, be involved in this war in a way that our success can be assured. Do you like that? Would that work for you? So spiritual intelligence, a knowledge and practice of biblically-based spiritual tools to guarantee success in the great controversy battle within, allowing Jesus then to restore his image in us. We must begin to equip our children to make battle with the enemy that you and I are battling 24-7 as well. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, Joshua 1.9. Read it with me. Equipping our children to understand that they do not need to be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You see, my friends, it is my prayer, it is my hope that together, we can find creative ways to offer our kids what I call a sustainable remedy. It's sustainable. It doesn't run out. You can't kill it. You can't lose it. You can't, it will never empty out for the hurt, wounded, startled, overwhelmed, stress out heart those are the kids we're serving 